Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining me this afternoon for our webinar, which is Customer Service Effects on Social Media. Um, my name is Christy. I own and manage uh, 180 Marketing, um, as well as another tourism business. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today is actually what I implement in, on a day-to-day -day basis. The webinar is designed to be interactive, so please feel free to use the Q&A functionality in Zoom to ask questions at any time that it suits you. Um, I'll keep an eye out for those questions and then uh, also at the end we'll have a little bit of time for you to ask more questions. Um, right, well let's get into it. So first of all what we're going to cover today, well today we're going to look at the suggestion that customer service is a single interaction whereas customer experience incorporates the entire customer journey. So we'll look at the customer journey itself um, and understanding that whole experience process. Um, we'll look at the dimensions of customer service, how important first impressions are. Um, we'll also discuss handling complaints effectively um, and using upselling strategies to really improve that customer service experience. We'll also, um, um, and then we'll sort of go on to talk about social media and that critical link between each customer interaction and social media and how what happens in a face-to-face -face basis or offline will quite often and in most cases go online. So throughout this webinar, you'll discover how important customer interactions are for your online presence, no matter what the nature of your business is. Um, and also we'll have a look at what you can do to generate that positive word of mouth from each and every customer. Okay. So going back to that, that um, theory that customer service is a single touch point. Um, and that touch point happens with a brand at the moment that they're in front of you um, or are ready to make that purchase. Whereas the customer experience impacts feelings and emotion and encompasses the entire customer journey. Customer experience is really defined by the interactions and experiences that your customer has with your business throughout that entire journey. So that can start from that first point of contact right through to becoming a happy customer and hopefully going on to be a loyal customer and essentially an advocate for your brand. So your job is to understand this whole experience process and then learn that critical link um, as I mentioned, between each customer interaction. And for the purposes, purpose of today's session, we'll specifically be looking at how social media fits into that customer experience. So rather than customer service sitting alone, we just need to consider your job to be managing the customer experience or customer experience management, um, as the term sort of lies. So customer, in my view, customer experience has to be a top priority for businesses. And the reason being is that companies that focus on that customer experience, um, they will often lead to a lower return rate, so a lower turnover of customers, and you'll increase revenues. That then in turn leads to higher profits, which is generally the ultimate goal. So successful customer experience management, in my view, requires a 360 degree view of customers with integrated and up-to-date data on your customers. So obtaining as much data as you can. Um, so we wanna understand your customers. We wanna create a customer journey map to identify each and every individual touch point that you might have with your customers. Um, and then we want them to develop an emotional connection to your brand. Uh, we are then going to cut, be able to capture their feedback um, and track their satisfaction. So implementing a social media strategy um, in your business will give you a chance uh, to communicate with customers at a level that makes sure that they feel part of your story. Also to encourage them to recommend your brand to others and at the very least provide you the feedback that you need. So an interesting stat is that one in three customers will leave a brand that they love after just one bad experience. So you really can't afford to have any bad experiences or for your customers, I should say, to have any bad experiences. Customers that rate companies um, higher in a customer, uh, higher customer service sort of uh, score, so let's say they rate you 10 out of 10, are said to spend 140% more and remain loyal with you for up to six years. So that's the ultimate goal. So if we look at the actual customer journey, 
um, on your screen. This is perhaps how yours may look, but keep in mind that it really does vary business to business, depending on the nature of your business um, and what industry you're in. But this gives you an idea of how that journey might look. To map the journey for your business, what you need to do is think about and visualize each and every touch point that you have with your future and with your current clients. So really think about that step of interaction, starting with the first, um, that an initial contact that you have, or you may not have specific contact, but the initial step where the customer discovers your product or service. Now that could happen online, it could happen offline, or it could happen in front of you. So that exercise of mapping out this journey will help you step into your customer's shoes and see your business from their perspective rather than from an internal perspective. So essentially you map this journey before you design their customer experience. So what the experience will look like at each and every touch point. First of all, you need to know what those touch points are. So on this diagram, you can see the online interactions at the top and then the more traditional or offline interactions are at the bottom. Um, and have a look there. You'll see social networks sitting at the end in that advocacy phase. Think about online ads. Think about word of mouth via social media. Um, it actually pops up more than just that once. So for the journey itself, it typically starts with awareness and consideration, which you see there in the orange. So they're the first stages of the customer journey, and they're absolutely critical to adding people into your sales funnel or getting them to convert. Um, a quick response time here leaves a really lasting positive impression. So think about someone who's just found your product or service, perhaps through an ad. Um, it looks like your product will meet their needs and solve a problem that they might have, but they've got a question about one of the features of your product or service or one of the inclusions. So they're going to need a very quick response. The next stage of the customer journey is that conversion or purchase. And this part of the journey is absolutely crucial because it really deepens the customer relationship with your business. This is also where your leads or potential customers decide that your products are the best for their needs. Um, and if they do that and it matches what they need, they'll then buy something. So the quicker people can get to that point with as few barriers as possible, the better it's going to be for you. So then we have retention. Um, with the retention, it's really not enough to just spend your, your marketing energy with new clients. Retention is your opportunity um, to keep clients uh, and therefore not have that same marketing spend. Um, it's not enough to just give them what they need and then leave them to fend for themselves either. Once they've bought something, you need to engage with them uh, throughout the product purchase and after the product purchase to ensure that they'll keep coming back. Now, if your customers do stop hearing from you um, and you stop helping them get our value from whatever your product or service might be throughout their entire life cycle of that product or service, then you risk making that life cycle much, much shorter or the life cycle of the, the customer staying within your business. High retention will help you to drive um, further customer acquisition as well. So keep that in mind. And that will happen more so organically with the help of referral programs and other incentives. Um, so to get people to share about you, to, um, to refer people to your business, you need to be engaging with them and reminding them of the value that you as an organization or as an individual can offer. Um, and also communicate the increased benefits that they can get by sharing their experience with other people, which then leads to obviously more business um, ultimately. Advocacy comes with satisfied customers. Uh, so 83% of satisfied customers say that they're willing to share or refer to their network of friends and family, if they're satisfied, of course. So we want each and every customer to be an advocate, essentially, if we can, um, by sharing their positive experience. So there's a large component of this that sits with social media. So that advocacy space um, is really social media. Customer expectations are definitely on the rise and they will continue to grow. So it'll force companies to reinvent themselves constantly to be able to survive. The reason being that there's so much availability of different types of products and services that a range of different brands offer. So the customer really is in a strong position here in that they've got a lot of choice. So the, the presence of online, online platforms and social media gives them greater control um, in the decision-making process because there's so much more research that they can do. So we'll have a look at this customer journey a bit later, but just keep in mind, um, you really need to tailor 
this journey to your business. So map out your customer journey and then think it by thinking about all of those touch points. Now, a really good way to improve the customer journey is to really obviously understand your customers. You have to remember that not all customers are the same and they will therefore not expect the same things when they're purchasing different products or services. Everyone will have different needs and expectations because they fall into different categories. Um, they might differ because of their age, their social background, their economic background. Culturally, they could differ. They may have different um, special interests and they also may have different physical or mental abilities. To be able to successfully meet their needs and expectations, you have to really know your audience. So you have to establish a clear picture of who exactly your audience is. And that requires going beyond just your basic demographic information like their age, their gender, their location. Um, you need to develop a really clear picture of your target market. To make sure that you're reaching the right buyers, you have to know who the ideal buyers are for you as well, who the ones are that represent the biggest revenue for you and are easiest to advertise to. Um, once you recognize that um, and, and maybe researching your ideal customers, you might determine that they're not who you think they are. So we can look at your past customer base and really um, dive into your data that you might sit within your uh, point of sale systems, your booking systems, that kind of thing. Think about what traits correlate with re repeat purchases or with specific um, purchases. Think about what segments tend to become your more long-term or loyal customers. Absolutely do your research internally, but also do, do your research externally. Have a look at data that can be provided through the Australian Bureau of Statistics, um, through maybe any industry um, reports that may be available, um, and have a look at what trends there are. Are there new and emerging target audiences that you might like to develop your products and services around? Well, you always need to be looking for new ways to meet your customers' needs as well. So once you've identified who your most valuable audience are or who your ideal customer is uh, and what it is that they're looking for, your goal should to be, be to continuously find new ways to better meet their needs. You really need to keep in mind that your audience uh, is never going to change their expectations to fit your product. You're always going to have to... Uh, or edit, update, amend, um, perhaps develop your product to suit their needs. Also look at developing a customer-centric culture. So encourage your employees to keep your customers at the center of each and every decision they make. We'll expand a little bit on customer service shortly, uh, but you have to set minimum standards for your team. So if your team interacts with your customers, um, then your you, it's going to have a major impact on whether or not your, your company meets the needs of your expectations. So hiring and training an excellent team is absolutely crucial and making sure that that customer service is really at the focus of everything they do. Also collect feedback regularly. Um, social media makes that very easy for us and we'll talk about that soon, but are there any other ways that you can collect feedback? Feedback potentially on the usage of your products or service, satisfaction rates of your product or service, keeping in mind that you're continually tracking this feedback to make sure that you are meeting the needs of your customers. The last thing I'd suggest um, in terms of meeting your customer needs and expectations is looking at scoping out your competitors. So absolutely know what they're doing at any given time. You can follow them on their social media. You can have a look at their website regularly, doing comp a competitor analysis um, on a regular basis to look out for perhaps new competitors in your market or um, products that are evolving uh, within uh, that competitive space. So definitely knowing your competitors, knowing what they're doing and potentially identifying new comp competitors will really allow you to make sure that you are meeting the needs and expectations and continually evolving your product or service um, to, to satisfy your customers' needs. So customer service has three dimensions. Um, customer service is really at the core of meeting your, your customers' needs and expectations. Now, these three dimensions, you've got human dimensions, and that relates to your body language, attitudes, how motivated your staff are, or perhaps how motivated they are not, which could be um, a concern. So all of that human factor um, that relates to how you're serving your customers. 
Then you've got business dimensions. So this is your processes and procedures, uh, your actual product offering and your staff knowledge of specific products and services and how you deliver that product or service. Also the quality of your product or service. Now, the third element is the hidden dimensions. So hidden dimensions can be tricky because they are just that, they are hidden. They're the underlying things in a business. So what's going on behind the scenes that could be impacting your customer service? Um, it could be your business policies. It could be any technical issues behind the scenes, perhaps pressure on staff because there's limited staff resources and they're feeling a bit overworked. Uh, it could even be level of in, levels of empowerment of your staff. So do they know that they have um, or what sort of um, empowerment they have at different times, in different circumstances, in the ability to offer deals, to compensate uh, for any complaints and th those kind of things. Uh, also factors like quality working relationships. Are there staff that are getting on with each other? And the last thing that is largely beyond your control, but certainly a hidden factor is staff bringing home problems into work. Um, and that can really impact on customer service. So with those hidden dimensions, what you have to think about or how you can think about it is a duck swimming on a pond. So looking at how calm they are just sitting, appearing like they're just sitting on, on the top of the pond and cruising along. Under the water, their legs are going absolutely frantically to get them where they're going. So that's essentially what we need in customer service. We need from a customer facing perspective, everything to look absolutely smooth and like we're just sailing along, even if there are these hidden factors that are underlying. So finding a way to make sure that you are aware of those hidden factors um, and that your staff or yourself, you know that they um, should never impact the actual customer service experience or the customer experience. Good customer service is absolutely critical to the success of all businesses. Um, it can really elevate you well above your competition. Um, but I would suggest you always use the mantra which is an obviously an old mantra, but under promise and over deliver, it will absolutely improve your customer retention rate. Um, and you need to remember if customers are frustrated with the service that they receive from you at any point, they're more likely to obviously rate your service poorly, but they will go online. Also have a look at your reviews online. If you're not currently tracking what's happening online, have a look at your reviews on social media, have a look at your Google reviews, and then have a look at any other platforms in which people can review. So there's, depending on your business and the industry that you're in, there could be Yelp, there could be Zomato, there could be TripAdvisor. There's so many different platforms that people can review. Um, but just make sure that they are actually, um, that you're engaging with those reviews and you understand what's being said about you online and that you're responding from a management perspective. That also helps other customers uh, have, a, have a look at, at your business, what's going on. Even if there's negative reviews, a really good customer service practice is to address those in an open forum like that so that future and other prospective customers can see that you do care and that you do take that seriously. All right, so in terms of how do you improve your customer service to ensure that you have that good retention rate and ultimately have people becoming brand advocates, there are a few key areas that we'll go over, but starting with first impressions. So the customer journey absolutely starts with first impressions. So it's really important that we get it right. Each and every person interacts with a business for the same reason, and that's to solve a problem that they have or to satisfy a need or a want and to feel good. So keep in mind that people want to feel good about purchasing. These first impressions are made within, th well, between three and seven seconds of the, that initial meeting. So that is absolutely crucial as well. One thing that you need to keep in mind, there's a range of things that form a first impression, but in a lot of cases with a business, this is actually happening online. Um, so that first impression could be made on your social media channels, or it could be made on your website. People could be doing a search, getting onto your website, and then really quickly judging your business based on what they see there. So if you were to consider your website as your 24 hour day, seven day a week salesperson, does it meet the needs of your customers? Uh, does it represent your brand accurately? And are you actually investing time and resources into your website? In a physical sense, 
um, what forms your first in, the first impression there would be your environments or your the presentation of your venue or the location that you're based. Um, and that can start from signage. Um, I regularly look at um, different co company signage and it could be that signage is outdated and looks absolutely terrible. And that that is a reflection on your business. So it could be before they even step into your actual workspace. Those environment first impressions can, once they do step in, can include smell, it can include temperature, it can include music or that general atmosphere. You have to keep consistent with your brand in this sense um, and also know who your target audience is. Um, and you quite, you quite often get this in a retail sense where if it's a younger audience, you walk into a store, the music's loud, the people that are serving you are young, they're dressed in the clothing that you're selling, um, that kind of thing. So really meet the needs or match uh, the expectations of your ideal customer or of your audience um, in that environmental perspective as well. Um, and that sort of touches on that, um, the next point, which is your personal image or your staff's image, uh, thinking about that. Also thinking about your language. Um, are you speaking in a local sort of language? Are you using slang? Um, are you speaking professionally? Do you, do, you know, is the nature of your, your customer base a little bit more casual? So really match that language. If you've got staff that aren't, they need to be trained in accordance with who your ideal customer is. This is um, to, to meet exactly how they like to speak and who and um, who they like to be served by, essentially. Body language is also crucial, thinking about um, how you're standing, how you're, you're presenting yourself from a body perspective to make sure that that body language is strong enough, but it's warm and inviting as well. And that sort of goes into if you're smiling, um, are you happy? Uh, are, you, are you engaging people even from a distance as they walk in? Now, Disney have a, a rule and the concept is it's a 15 and 10 rule. So their rule is that if you're within 15 feet, which is about four and a half metres of a staff member, if the customer is uh, within that distance, they have to acknowledge the customer with a smile. If they're 10 feet, so three and a half meters, they have to acknowledge them with a smile and a verbal acknowledgement. So, hi, how can I help you? Or, hi, how are you going? That kind of thing. So, that acknowledgement makes people feel um, welcome and that like they're important. And essentially, going back to what I said, people purchase things because they want to feel good and they want to feel good throughout that process. So that'll create a really lasting first impression, whether it be acknowledging them, complimenting them, talking about something that, um, that is relevant. Um, also throughout the customer service process, having attitude and empathy, having a good attitude and um, having empathy is, is absolutely crucial as well. Just think about that acknowledgement, um, going back to that, uh, it happens sometimes you walk into a business and there could be someone um, that's quite busy. They're looking down at their desk. You know that they know you're in the room because as humans, we can sense people when they walk into a room, we've got peripheral vision so we can sort of see them. Um, so it's absolutely crucial, that acknowledgement. It actually happened to me yesterday where I was at a business. I'm not going to name that business, but I walked in and there were several people at a counter um, I was the only customer in front of them. I could see that they were busy. They all had their head down. I was sort of looking, waiting for someone to acknowledge me, waiting for someone to make that eye contact. And that's really all I wanted was just to be acknowledged, someone to go, look, I didn't even have to say it, but that eye contact says, I'm doing something right now, but I know that you're there. So those kind of things are absolutely crucial. And as it says on the screen, you'll never get a second chance to make a first impression. So keep that in mind. That's really, really important as well. All right. So complaint handling is the next element of customer service. So virtually everyone will have to deal with customer complaints at some point in their business or in their career. Um, unfortunately, that's just the nature of um, customer service. So it could be something as simple as maybe getting an order slightly wrong, or there could be a major business error, but how you handle that complaint makes all the difference. So I like to look at this process in terms of a complaint handling process uh, with the acronym LEARN. So listen, 
to listen to the customer's concern without interrupting them and taking the time to actually listen to their full story. Um, to empathize, so be sympathetic, um, understand what they're going through and acknowledge what they're going through, um, to apologize where that's appropriate. So if it is something that the business has done wrong, then it can very much be uh, appropriate to apologize. There could also be cases where a business hasn't specifically done anything wrong, but an apology in terms of I'm sorry that you're feeling this way can really go a long way. And that comes with the empathy. People want uh, you to be, well, you to empathize with them. So it's really important that that apology sort of ties in with that. Uh, the reaction part is really important as well. So you need to evaluate different solutions and determine what that reaction is going to be. You also need to know or have your staff member know at what point, um, what, what reaction they can have. Do they just need to take it to a supervisor or a manager or uh, can they deal with the situation there? And I'll touch on that a bit in a second. Um, and then the notify and follow up stage. So after you offer and provide a solution to personally check back with the person to make sure that they're satisfied. Essentially what you're checking here is to make sure that your reaction has actually made them feel better and resolved the situation. Sometimes that, rea sometimes, sorry, that reaction phase might not be enough. So in that notify and follow up stage, you might determine that actually they're still not happy. So you need to go back a step, have a look at that reaction. Was it enough? Is there something more I can do? Now, following this process will have a major difference in your uh, how you can turn people around from a complaint perspective. There are certain reasons that we don't handle complaints very well. The first one being we're too busy. A lot of complaints happen as a result of things getting missed or uh, you know things occurring because you're too busy. So if you're too busy to handle the complaint, it's really going to amplify the situation and it's going to make it a lot worse. Being defensive is also another reason that we don't handle complaints very well. Now, with us in a small business or being a small business owner, it's very easy to become defensive. Um, defensive could be anything uh, as large as being actually defensive, openly defensive and denying what the customer is saying, or it could just be that you try and come up with a solution too quickly, which can come across as defensive or um, dismissal. So keep that in mind. Um, staff can also be intimidated by a lack of training. So if they're not trained on how to deal with customer complaints from a customer service perspective, then they might not deal with them very well because they're just purely intimidated by the situation. So make sure that you do have a complaint handling process, whether it's as simple as the learn process or it's more comprehensive. Make sure that you have a system in place and make sure that that system is trained to your staff to really have the, the highest um, chance of being able to solve complaints quickly. Uh, staff, um, and I touched on this earlier, but staff can be unsure of their empowerment. So at what stage can they react? At what stage can they offer a solution or a range of solutions to their customer? Or at what stage do they need to escalate that up the chain to perhaps a supervisor, to a manager, or to yourself as a business owner? Um, so that's really important that staff, and through the training that I mentioned, and through understanding the complaint handling process, um, you should be able to really discuss that empowerment level. One thing that can frustrate people and the complaint handling process or the complaints themselves are, can be a source of great frustration for the customer. So we're trying, trying at all times to really limit and reduce that frustration. Um, and one thing that can be really frustrating is when people don't offer the right solution. So keep that in mind. Um, and that last point, which we've definitely touched on, is a lack of procedures or a procedural break, breakdown. If your staff know the procedures, they know your policy, they know exactly what to do in a complaint handling situation, um, then they'll have a much stronger uh, response to any complaints. Complaints do happen. We talk about them from a customer service perspective, but as you know, what happens off offline will quickly go online. So it has pretty severe impacts on your business should that complaint not be handled correctly at that um, initial stage. 
Another way to really improve customer service, but also to improve your revenues is going to be suggestive selling. So suggestive selling is a sales technique where the employee um, asks the customer if they'd like to include an additional purchase or recommends a product that might suit that client. So it's used to increase the purchase amount of the client. And then that, of course, uh, increases the revenues of the business. But what it also does is really um, Im improves your customer service. So it makes customers think that you actually care and they understand um, that you care, you understand them, I should say, uh, and therefore you've got some ideas based on what you know about them. So we'll go into this a little bit more and how you actually do it. So basically the best way to look at suggestive selling is to incorporate a feature and a benefit. So a feature is something about the product or service. So what, how, what's the functionality? What's the feature of that? And then the benefit is what it means to the individual customer. So think about what you can offer that links the two. So what's in it for the customer? So if you go back to your greeting, your greeting is absolutely key in finding out this information about the customer. So one, when if you greet them right and you engage with them, you start to learn about them and you can be continually thinking, what feature can you give them based on what you know about them? Um, also by what you can see as well. So you might see someone walk in with, um, you know, with kids and they're struggling, they've got a lot going on, offering them a seat or a, an area that they can go to be comfortable to get, you know, get organized before they, they look at um, a per purchase or some kind of transaction with you. Um, you can find out more from these customers by looking at open or asking open-ended questions. Open-ended questions will really encourage a full and more of a meaningful answer. Um, and you use your own knowledge and or feelings. So um, try to, to integrate there. What we're trying to do is to avoid that dreaded word of no. Um, an open-ended question is the opposite of a closed-ended question. Uh, so we don't want a single word response. Um, so open-ended questions, um, you can be anything, tell me what you have in mind, what's the occasion is a good one. That can really lead to upselling or cross-selling. Um, what kind of holidays do you enjoy if they're, you know, if you're a travel agent and they're booking something there or what are you most looking forward to about this product service experience? Really understanding the people and, and what they like just by simply asking a few questions um, can really, really help with the customer service experience, but obviously upselling and in turn generating more revenues. Sharing your experiences with them can really help as well. Um, know your products, know your range of products, know how you can cross sell. Think about um, some of the key items that you can offer. So when a customer, if a customer normally orders a particular thing, you can then offer them something else that maybe complements that product or that range. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, what we're trying to do here is improve the customer service experience uh, that will lead to a more positive experience that's in turn going to um, translate into a higher retention rate and then stronger advocacy, all of which will go online, but all of which will also um, generate new customers and repeat customers. So that's the ultimate goal in terms of suggestive selling. So how does that customer journey uh, fit in with and relate to the social media space? Well, firstly, just having a look at what social media is. It's really any website or application that enables users to create and share content or to participate in any kind of social networking. So you could be looking at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or other social sharing sites. You have to keep in mind that social media is much more than messaging uh, and sort of an acquisition channel. It really also directly impacts your search engine optimization. So how well your website ranks um, in a search engine. So I'll expand a little bit more on that in just a minute. But before I do, why is it so important for us? Well, 88% of people are influenced by reviews and online comments. So that is a huge number of people that are directly influenced by what they see online. Social pressure can really tarnish your brand as quickly as you grow it. And you need to keep in mind that fingertips are always on the move. So people have social at their fingertips, but they're continually looking at it and engaging with it. 
So it could be that you've got a customer that's waiting in a line um, a little bit too long. They could be a bit disgruntled about the service. They can quickly let their friends know on Facebook whether or not they've enjoyed their time at your business or enjoy, enjoyed your the service that you're offering. They can go on to other specific review sites. It could be a Google review. It could be, like I said, TripAdvisor. They could blog on their own site and have a, a good following um, as a blogger. Um, about products that they've purchased or the service experience. So social media has really played a key role in the power shift to our customers. Um, so you have to think about how immensely connected the world has become since the introduction of social media. If you've had a bad experience, you'll post it online. If you wanna praise a business or if someone wants to compliment you, um, on a product that they've um, that they've started using, they'll post a review. Um, they might put something on YouTube um, of your product or service in use. It could go onto Instagram. So there's a lot of positives in that sense if you get it right. But the risks of social media can really hugely impact your reputation, and that's what we're trying to control here. Um, there's no there's no trickery here. Good quality ser customer service is going to result in excellent social media as well. Well. So the two have to be interlinked. So social media, as I say, can really positively impact your customer service. So your job is to have a look at how and where these social interactions fit into your customer journey. You've got to make sure that you're maximizing your efforts here um, and you're a part of any conversation that it, that's going on, that you're listening to the feedback from your customers. So in terms of that, some tips that I have are um, to look at this as a form of two-way brand engagement and the benefits that come with that. So customers absolutely love it when a business shares their information, their tips, their ideas, it could be even their, their photos. Um, but they also love it when you share your own information, um, particularly if it's product related or even service related, give them something back um, and make it personal so that they can, uh, they can get something from following you as well. Customers love to send um, a message out to, to you. So if they are, make sure that you respond back. That two-way engagement on social is absolutely crucial and it's such a great way to build that brand loyalty. Um, it'll really help give your customer, your company sorry, its own voice as well. So you want to really establish yourself um, in a personal sense um, as, a, as a company as well. Obviously, when you're engaging online, particularly on social media, your brand voice is really important and speaking, acting um, professionally and in line with who your target audience is, is absolutely crucial. So if you are doing things like posting tips and ideas and information, make sure that it's aimed at your target audience and it's the information that they want to see because they're the people that are going to be following your social channels and in turn purchasing from you. Um, I would also consider social media to be an extension of your contact info. So customers really expect a response to their comments or concerns quite immediately. I would say within hours, not days. And social media lets customers reach out to you without getting stuck on hold on a phone or waiting for an email response. We're very impatient as consumers, so we really need that quick turnaround. They don't even want to, um, you know, customers don't even want to find that hassle of finding your phone number. So make sure that that's readily available, but they might just want to message you on social. So make sure that you've got all of the mechanisms such as notifications and that kind of thing set up so that you can have that instant response. Um, the positive impact of social media is, uh, is in terms of a complaint perspective is that it allows you to really nip complaints in the bud quickly and easily. So if you avoid social media, it's not going to stop people from speaking up if they've got an issue. So if you've got a presence on those social channels, at least you'll know about issues as quickly as they are posted and you can address them promptly to get ahead of the situation, which is a really key thing. Um, there are studies that show that 70% of brands on social outlets respond to customer complaints within the, tw in the first 24 hours uh, have a much more successful um, rate in terms of customer satisfaction. So if you're not there to do it, um, you, your competitors will be watching or there'll be someone that's happy to pick up the slack in terms of if you're not satisfying a customer. So make sure you do have your phone number and email address listed so that you can provide uh, customers with a quick way to access you on a service that they already used to if they need support or help on that. Um, but at the very least, just nip those complaints in the bud very, very quickly. 
Another positive impact of social media is it allows you to spot trends or before or as they're happening. Um, you can keep your ear to the ground and pay really close attention to what consumers are saying. Now, they could be talking about your brand, your products and ways that they're using them, or they could be talking about your competitors or your competitors could be doing the talking. But make sure that you've got your ear to, to the ground in terms of what's being said online. Um, there's a lot of analytical information and forecast information that's available through social media channels as well. Um, but I would be looking at monitoring hashtags, following your competitors' pages, um, and just getting a head start on what your customers may want or need. Keep in mind that social media also gives you additional access to your customers. So social media channels shouldn't always be considered an advertising opportunity. It's really not the right medium for a full-blown sales campaign, but there's nothing to stop you from sharing the odd offer or deal, just as long as it's not the majority of your posts. Just remember the 80-20 rule here. So 80% of the time, be posting about your brand um, in an organic sense, a non-advertising sense, so that information, tips, hints, valuable information or valuable posts uh, to your consumers. And then 20% of the time, a bit of an advertising plug can't hurt. So if um, that's a, re a really key sort of benchmark. Nobody wants to go on social media and follow someone by choice that's advertising to them. So just remember that if you want to increase your sales in the long term through social media activities, you also need to be prepared to use that um, channel for customer service. So it's not just advertising. We need that genuine, true engagement there. I mentioned this quickly earlier, but social media does send signals from an SEO perspective, so to search engines, and it can really positively uh, impact your SEO. So not only do your social media interactions affect what your customer sees or what you see, but it also affects what happens behind the, behind the scenes and how well you come up in searches. So because so much sharing now takes place on major social media platforms, so social signals are extremely important to SEO. So social signals refer to a web page's collective shares, it could be likes, overall social media visibility as perceived by the search engine. So those activities really contribute to a page's organic search ranking. And they're seen as another form of authority. So similar to backlinks, if there's a lot going on in a social media space, in terms of like shares, engagement, if there's a big conversation around a brand, that sends a message to Google as an example of a search engine um, to say that this page is pretty strong. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of engagement there. Um, and that will then, like I said, in turn, make you rank better. So your strategy can be designed to increase your social media engagement, but it can also really raise your website search engine ranking. So if you're looking to raise your search ranking, um, have that comprehensive social media strategy, strategy in mind um, in, in addition to all of your usual SEO tactics, but keep in mind that it also has huge benefits from a customer service perspective too. Now, in terms of increasing social sig signals, first and foremost, uh, strong content is absolutely key. So that content has to be valuable. It has to be entertaining or informative. Um, it has to really encourage a positive interaction rather than being blatant, spammy advertising. Um, some really tried and true strategies for turning up on, turning up the volume, sorry, on your social signals could be to post regularly. So keep your brand at the top of the social media news feed, but just keep in mind here that we want to go for quality, not quantity. Um, engagement is what we're after here. So use images. Um, images greatly increase interaction rates for all social media types. So rather than just words, people will really resonate more with an image, particularly as it's so fast moving. So we're flicking through social media pages at such a rate, um, uh, social media, uh, we're on our social media, sorry, flicking through those news feeds at such a rate, we really need that image to stand out and to, to give us some incentive to stop, to read more and then potentially engage with what the post is. Listen, 
So hear what people are saying about your brand and respond to critique in a constructive and a positive way. Don't be defensive on social media. And you do see it sometimes. Unfortunately, it is largely with um, smaller companies and small businesses where you are emotionally connected to your product or service. You do feel that strong connection to it. So if someone says negative, uh, negative gives you negative feedback or says something negative, you do take it personally. Um, so keep that in mind as well. Um, also use tools to listen to what people are saying. Have a look at hashtags, set up hashtags so that people can uh, use these hashtags when they're posting and perhaps when they're using your product or service and then monitor them. Um, so monitoring uh, is very easy. There's a lot of free social media marketing apps that track your shares. They track retweets. They track likes, um, even keywords associated with your brand. Use those tools to make sure that you know what's being said online. Now, in terms of monitoring, one really easy way to monitor what's happening online, not necessarily in the social media space, but just um, in a web sense, is to use Google Alerts. Um, so Google alerts are absolutely great. Um, you log in through your Google account, set up an alert based on keywords. And anytime these keywords are mentioned anywhere throughout the web, you get an email sent to your inbox from Google. You have to be specific, obviously, um, not generic keywords. Otherwise, you'll be getting a lot, um, a, a big list of um, what's being said online. But at the bare minimum, have a look at your brand name, have a look at your competitors' names, that kind of thing. I would also consider all social media bases or platforms. I don't think you need to be on every single platform, but I think you need to consider each and every one. So have a think about, no, well, it, I guess it goes back to knowing exactly who your target audience is, um, knowing where they're likely to be. So if you know exactly who that target audience is, you will know what platforms they're on and therefore that's where you need to be. So if your target audience isn't on Twitter, for example, and through research, you know exactly who your target market is and you know that research has really determined that they're not on Twitter, then you don't have to be on that particular channel. But you definitely have to be where your target market is or where your key market, where you're, wherever your customers are, you need to be. Um, in terms of uh, producing content, produce content for your social media sites that are relevant to the target audience on that site. So your followers on Instagram could be different to your followers on Facebook. Try not to repeat content, the same content over different platforms. For me, I get the impression um, from organizations that do repeat that content uh, that it's, uh, yeah, it's a little bit like they're just, they don't have the time. So they're just repeating the content. So keep that in mind as well. Now, looking at supporting social media. So in order to be active on channels and encourage that engagement, you have to support social media within your business. Um, there's ways that you can do that. Uh, and it's, it's a bit of a, a cycle. So you need to listen, you need to talk, and you need to support. So listening um, is one of the elements to engage with your customers on social media. So you can listen online and you can listen offline. You can use free tools for social media monitoring that track those mentions, that track competitors, track events. You can um, become a social media immediate, sorry, monitoring specialist yourself, just spending time on social channels. Um, obviously, there's web monitoring tools like the Google Alerts that I mentioned. There's analytic tools that you can use so you can see what hits you're getting to your website and you can see where they're coming from. So are you getting hits to your site from Facebook, from Instagram? Have a look at the trends there. Also look at brand and reputation tools to work out what your, your scores are, essentially, how well you're perceived, what the positive feedback is, how well you're responding to reviews and that kind of thing. But import this data into your own reporting so that you're accountable, so that you're looking at it on a month-on-month -month basis and comparing results. Um, I think that's really important as well to, to have that reporting ele element um, and actively tracking what's going on. Um, and then, like I said, comparing those results month on month. In the talking sense, uh, you want to talk offline, in person. You want to talk online with pictures, with content, with responses to questions. 
Uh, it could be media releases. You could be engaging with your customers in many different ways, but you need to be talking with them. You can also engage with influencers. Keep in mind, there's more than just social media channels. There's blogs, there's videos. There could be communities uh, that relate to uh, your product or service. So make sure that you are talking and active on those and, and on obviously the social networks as well. The more that you're engaged as a brand, the more comfortable people will feel with you and the more they will feel that sense that they are building a relationship with you. If they build that relationship with you, there's a higher chance of them becoming a customer and then they go into that customer journey. So keep that in mind. Talking is absolutely crucial. Um, also support. So support is directing people to your socials where they can then talk. Uh, where you can then listen. So this is what I mean. It's a bit of a cycle. So if you direct people to the channels by having links to your socials, uh, by communicating in your store or in your um, in your workplace, your your social media channels, even on your website, trying to get people to link through um, so that they start following you and can engage in that conversation. Um, it's also a matter of listen that you can then listen to them. So if then if they don't know your social channels, therefore they're not posting to you. You've got nothing to listen to and no one to talk to. Um, so keep that in mind as well. Um, I would advertise your social media channels as much as you can, whether that be on your email signatures, your website, in store, by way of posters and that kind of thing. Um, you've got to communicate them verbally as well. So if you see people at your um, business taking photos, perhaps, let them know your hashtags, let them know, tag us in and we might repost your content. People absolutely love that. But you've got to support them by telling them what social media channels you like them to be on um, and encourage them to engage with you offline, obviously, but as well as online and encouraging your staff to do the same. I think that's really important. So going back to this customer journey and having a look at this map, as you can see, and hopefully as you gain from today, yeah, you know that social media is an absolutely essential part of this journey. So it really allows you to improve your customer service. It builds that relationship with customers by allowing you to engage with them. You can provide real-time responses to any customer questions. And through that process of listening, talking and supporting in the social media space, you can really enhance that advocacy component of the customer journey, but also enhance brand awareness, which will mean that you then become visible when your customers begin their journey. You have to remember that while most businesses focus their efforts on these first three stages of the journey, the awareness, the consideration and the purchase, it can be a huge missed opportunity because those last two stages, loyalty and advocacy or retention and advocacy, will bring you the most high value customers. And those customers in many cases will actually send you even more business through those recommendations and becoming true advocates. So this mapping of the customer journey is a major part of the process. Keep that in mind. I would highly encourage you to look at your customer journey and to map this out in a similar way. Have a look at um, exactly what the touch points are and make sure that you are engaged at every touch point and have a look at what that customer experience is. So going back to our theory of customer experience management, Customer service is just that one-time interaction, whereas customer experience management manages that entire experience, um, then you will really um, have the opportunity to build those long-term customers and obviously get business, get higher revenues and generate um, more profits is the ultimate goal. All right, so that wraps up the session on customer service effects on social media. Um, I hope it makes sense to everyone and I hope there's some things that you can take out of it to improve or at the very least better understand that connection between what happens face-to-face -face with your customers and what happens online. So I'm going to stay online now uh, and answer any questions that you might have. But just keep in mind, we've really only just scratched the surface of social media and of customer service. So if you do want to know more or if you want to talk about any other aspect of your business, you can book online um, a one-on-one -on -one appointment with me through your Ask Us login or join any of our future webinars or workshops. 
So definitely keep that in mind. Keep engaged with the program. And thanks again for joining me today. Um, I do hope that we get to chat again soon. But like I said, I'm going to stay online for a short time now and answer any questions that you might have.